One of the most sought after services at the Koan Center is the Far Infrared Thermal Slimming Treatment. The Sudatonic creams stimulate sweat glands to break down fatty acids, leaving you with toned skin after a totally relaxing experience. The Koan Center, the more we see you, the better you look. So again, we will let you guys have two minutes to share a little bit about yourself and uh, yeah, we'll get started with that. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, one thing that being on the campaign trail in an important race like this really emphasizes for you is how much we need to increase our level of civic participation. So I just want to say thank you for taking the time out to be involved enough and committed enough to learn about the candidates in these races. Um, I'll share a little bit of background about myself. Many of you may know me from my time in the spotlight about two years ago. I stood up for women's health care and took on Mr. Limbaugh. But what I, oh, thank you. Uh, but what I want to emphasize about that is that I don't think it has anything to do with what qualifies me to be your next state senator. I hope that it gives you an example of what my leadership looks like, what my character looks like, how I conduct myself in the public spotlight. But what is important for you to know is my background of work on the issues that are important to this district. So for about 10 years now, I've worked on state policy and legislation on everything from affordable access to health care, to housing, to LGBT rights, to of course gender equality, uh, to criminal justice reform and public assistance types of issues. And in this campaign, I have talked with many of you about the issues that I believe are most important for our district to address environmental protection and progress as a way of continuing to protect the coastline and the Santa Monica Mountains, as well as a place where the state can invest and really create jobs while moving us forward. I'm also committed to campaign finance reform uh, to increase disclosure as well as increasing the involvement of community members, not just large dollars and special interests in our campaigns. And finally, I'm committed to increasing our investment in affordable education at the early childhood level and the higher education level. Because that's the type of progressive public interest work that I've spent my career on, whether it's working on legislation or representing victims of human trafficking and domestic violence directly. Thank you. And Ben, can you share a little bit about yourself? Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and it's great to see so many people here and so much interest. Uh, my name is Ben Allen, and I'm uh, born and raised in this district. I grew up in Santa Monica. Uh, the son of two educators. I'm an attorney. I teach education, law, and policy at UCLA Law School, and I've been a two-term member of the Santa Monica Malibu School Board. Uh, after after college, I ended up going, uh, staying some time in Washington D.C. Uh, had the opportunity to serve as a staffer on Capitol Hill, and then later uh, came back to, to 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 California. Went to law school at UC Berkeley, and had the chance to serve as the one student member of the University of California's Board of Regents which was a really fascinating experience. And I was able to get a couple measures passed through the board. One of them that strengthened public interest loan forgiveness programs at the professional schools to make sure that there'd be some sort of plan in place when the deans uh, raise tuition on those people going up through the professional school program so that if they want to go and take their, uh, take their degree and go into public service, there'd be some sort of mitigation, some sort of support for them. I was also able to pass a measure that, that strengthened the green building standards for the university. And now we're up to about 166 LEED certified buildings for the whole university system, which is the most of any university system in the, in the country as a result of the, of the resolution. Uh, I came back to, to my hometown and got very involved in, in local uh, public education issues. I've been on the school board now uh, for two terms. Uh, it's been a challenging time with all of the budget uh, cuts and budget challenges, uh, but we were able to come up with some really innovative ways to bring in some new revenues and make some uh, cuts at the administration, and help to protect and preserve the district during, during, uh, during this tough financial time. Uh, I'm passionate about environmental protection. I'm so proud to have the endorsement of folks like Fran Pathley, who put the, the state uh, at the front of the conversation in terms of climate change. Uh, I care a great deal about the Santa Monica Mountains and, and mountains uh, preservation. That's why folks like Zeb Yaroslavsky and Ed Edelman and Al uh, Tony Bielinson have endorsed me. Uh, I also care a lot about jobs and the economy, and I'm, I'm proud to have the support from across the political spectrum, including people like Don Kanabi and, and Richard Reardon. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, debate tonight, uh, today, and, and this will be fun. Great, thank you. Fantastic. Both of you are aged in your 30s. Ben, you were 36, and Sandra, you were 33. Do you think Sacramento needs some young blood, and how do you think your age will approach how you 
um, deal with issues in the state senate. I think you have a microphone right next to us. Uh, yes, I do think Sacramento needs young blood in a, in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, it needs some new and innovative ideas. And that's actually how I started my career, was working in a nonprofit agency where I founded and led an evaluation program where we looked at which types of social services were really accomplishing their goals and how could we use state and government funding most efficiently and effectively. So it's that kind of innovative thinking that I do think is, is sorely needed in Sacramento. But there is a really important moment that we have right now for young adults. And I know many of you uh, either are young adults or have them in your family and have seen the kind of challenges that they're facing around the affordability of higher education as well as finding good paying jobs when they get out of school. There's actually a critically high unemployment rate for young adults right now. And it just continues as a cycle because each year there's a new graduating class of entry level workers competing for those same kinds of jobs. That's why I'm proud to have worked with Young Invincibles right here in Los Angeles to address those kinds of economic concerns for young adults. Uh, to think about programs like bringing in AmeriCorps to the state level so that we have students and, and new professionals gaining uh, experience while giving back to their communities. And I'm really proud to be uh, calling for increased investment in affordability of higher education throughout the public system, whether that's the UC or the community colleges and at the Cal State level as well. Ben, you know, about in Sacramento? And, yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, I think it's actually was very interesting. We had a we had a very crowded field in the primary. Eight candidates, some pretty uh, exceptional people. We included a mayor, a former state assembly member, the former head of the LA County Medical Association, former head of the Writers Guild. And the interesting thing is the two youngest candidates out of the eight ended up making it to the runoff. So even though, um, uh, so even though they, they told us that the average voter in that election was like 65 or over, uh, the, the, there still was, uh, I think, an interest in the electorate to, to support younger candidates uh, because of, I think, some of the issues that you bring up, Brent, that, that the, the folks do want to have some fresh blood in, in Sacramento. Uh, I think Sanders absolutely right, and one of the things that's frustrating sometimes to, when you talk to younger people who don't tend to vote in higher numbers is you say, look, you've got the most at stake here. You've got the long, you know, you've got sort of uh, so so much at stake in terms of, of both the costs associated with education, the costs associated with your own uh, kids' education. When when you talk a little bit about uh, about early childhood programming, for example, one of the great challenges that we face in a city like Santa Monica is how extraordinarily difficult it is for middle class families to afford. Uh, really high quality early childhood programming, and, and and you know these are these are young families. These are these are my friends who now have little kids who are really struggling to find a good place to send their kid to to a decent uh, early childhood program. And that's one of the things that the city can can help out with things like you know, transportation infrastructure and, and investing in, in a good rail system for Los Angeles so we can enter into the League of Civilized Cities when it comes to the way we get around, uh, improving our road quality, uh, improving our environmental. Uh, protection, environmental quality, improving our educational system and our healthcare system. These are all things that young people really need to care about. Uh, and, and, and I think those are the issues that, that I certainly want to bring with me uh, if, I'm, if I'm fortunate enough to get elected to, to the state senate. Uh, but I think also at the same time we've got to make sure we're looking across the board. There's a lot of, of great challenges out in the economy and, and we also need to make sure we're looking out for our seniors too. Uh, so my time's up, but, uh, but we'll be, be able to talk more about this. Thanks, Ben. Just earlier, we heard current state Senator Ted Lewis speak about several of the California laws that he was an author of. What issue or law would you like to tackle in one day that you would like to see get passed? I will switch up the order and we'll get Ben to answer this one first. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, I think one of the things we need to look at uh, involves, I'd like to see us um, extend Proposition 30. I think it was an important measure that really helped to, to provide the funding necessary for our education system at a critical moment in the, uh, in the, uh, in the state's history. And it would be, you know, extending it out would, would provide an additional revenue source that would help to shore up uh, some of the challenges we have in education funding uh, without raising people's taxes, uh, at, least, at least raising them from, from the current levels. Uh, I, I certainly, uh, I'd like to, to work, as I said, on, on Santa Monica Mountains. Purchasing and, and jump-starting uh, funding for metro rail, metro rail construction, and, and I'm also very interested in, in some of the same kind of campaign finance reforms issues that that uh, Sandra talked about. One of them I think we need to talk a lot about is the fact that right now, uh, Leland Yee, uh, the famous Leland Yee, was actually taking money from lobbyists literally a day before he was then voting on their bills on the floor of the legislature. That is allowed under current state law. That's low-hanging fruit that we need to ban. 
Uh, and we need to look at, at, at ending uh, donations made in the last 100 days of, of the lobby of the, of the legislative session from lobbyists who have business before the legislature. Thanks, Ben. Sandra? Uh, I'll try to stick to just one thing on day one. Uh, campaign finance reform is my top priority. Thank you. And you know, I think this is an area where we can actually make a lot more progress as a state than we can at the federal level. And as California, we really have an obligation to do that. We know that again and again, we lead the rest of the country. And I see that as our responsibility to continue that kind of leadership. So unfortunately, the Disclose Act just recently failed. Uh, and we need to come back to the table to increase uh, the types of disclosure that we're requiring of corporations, of large donors, and make it really clear to voters who is behind uh, the types of super PACs that are funding our elections. But we also need to go further, because it's not just that special interests have too much of a say in Sacramento, it's also that individuals and community members have been crowded out. So let's find ways to draw the community back into our civic conversation. I'd like to do that by taking the kind of matching campaign fund programs that we have at the local level and implementing those on a state level. I've funded my campaign largely through small dollar contributions and I'd like to give other candidates an incentive to do that as well. Okay, let's move on to the economy. If elected, what would you do during your first term in the state senate to increase more jobs in California? Ben, do you want to answer that first? Yeah, great question. Um, I think part of it has to do with, uh, with, with, first of all, doing more to incentivize a lot of the, the critical growth that we have in our area. And we, uh, we just passed a, a tax incentive uh, bill that strengthened uh, support for the TV and, and film industry. And I think that's really important. It's a key part of California's heritage, key part of Los Angeles' heritage, uh, keeping those jobs here. And so I support those kinds of programs. And, and uh, one of the things I think we also have to do is listen to business, engage with business, hear the sorts of concerns and fears and things that they need to help um, grow. Uh, it's interesting, sometimes I think a lot of legislators throw up all sorts of, leg of regulation, legislation that seems good at the time, but oftentimes ends up being really problematic. Uh, the legislature, for example, pushed through this ban on, on latex gloves to be used in part, as part of, sorry, sorry, uh, required that latex gloves be used as part of food preparation, and it ended up being that, uh, that food was getting stuck in the folds of the gloves, people weren't happy, were washing their hands a lot less frequently, and what was really a well-intentioned public health matter ended up, ended up causing a lot of, of, of extra costs to the restaurant industry without really improving safety, in fact, actually uh, making safety worse. So part of it involves engaging with the people you're gonna regulate and talk to them about, about the effectiveness of the things you wanna push forward. Cool, thanks, Ben. You know, we have worked really hard as a state to get to the point where we are now where we do have a little bit of a surplus. We've got debt to pay back, but we have a surplus again. And so we need to think strategically about how we invest that. And I think the first criteria for how to invest that has to be how does it keep our economy moving forward and growing so that we continue the recovery path that we're on. Uh, so my guiding rules in thinking about that are uh, how do we put more money into the pockets of working families? We can do that by things like increasing the minimum wage, getting it to a living wage, uh, but also through things like encouraging and giving tax incentives uh, to small business owners. I certainly support things like, thank you. I certainly support things like the small, uh, the film tax credit, but I wanna make sure that we're working across industries to create the best paying jobs in our communities, the ones that stay in our communities and contribute socially as well. And that's why I'm really proud to have the support of the California Small Business Association, uh, because I've been part of that type of the economy and I want to make sure we're growing it here in California. Okay, we'll have Sandra answer this question first, but what is one of your top priorities when it comes to gender equality and how do you think you can act on this if elected? Um, well, I, I suppose I, I hopefully don't need to review that gender equality is one of the areas that I've spent a lot of time on my career and that I am deeply committed to. Uh, it's, at its core, it's about having every Californian uh, be able to advance in their life. So I think there are a number of areas that we can make progress here. Number one, there are still needs for expansion of affordable access to health care, specifically around women's health care, around reproductive justice concerns. There's things like ending the family cap, which impacts the reproductive choices of poorer women. Uh, there's the early childhood education investment that I spoke about, which is not only important for educational progress, but allows primarily women, who are often still the caretakers, uh, to be able to go back into the workforce 
workforce contribute and advance in their careers and solves the childcare crises that so many women face. We also have to continue to make progress on things like equal pay for equal work, but also issues like the minimum wage and like protections for low wage workers primarily benefit women because women are still the ones doing that work. Thanks, Sandra. A couple of things. First of all, in addition to some of the things that Sandra mentioned, I think we've, when we talk about pay equity, one thing that the government can do is actually you know, is try to put government contractors on the line and really hold them, their feet to the fire when it comes to whether they're actually enforcing uh, the principles of pay equity, gender pay equity, uh, in their subcontracting work. And that's something that legislators can do, something that would certainly be very important to do. When it comes to the issue of, of healthcare access, in the wake of the Hobby Lobby decision, there's now some legislation that I think we really need to pass that will uh, provide women who've now been denied access to reproductive health care as a result of that decision, uh, access to other, you know, to, to other Medi-Cal, or, or also requiring uh, employers who switch when there's, when there's a change in, uh, in, 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 the, in the leadership of a company, uh, that they can, they can continue their access to reproductive health care under, uh, under their current health care plan. So those are some things that need to, be, need to be addressed. The final thing I want to bring up is STEM education for, for young women. It's something that we care a lot about in our school district, but uh, there, there's so much growth in science and technology jobs, and we really need to make sure our young women are are, are finding access to those kinds of that kind of education, those kinds of job opportunities. Thanks, Ben. I'll get you to answer this one first. What is your opinion of the current public California education system, and what improvements do you think can be made? Yeah, good question. Uh, well, so it's interesting. I, I think first of all, uh, we've got a lot of challenges. There's no question, uh, and, and there's a lot of reasons why we have these challenges. Some of it has to do with extraordinary poverty that exists in the state. Uh, some of it has to do with, the, with our grotesque underinvestment in public education. It's not all about the money, but I'll tell you what, we're spending about half per pupil than what they're spending in Vermont, Vermont Rhode Island, New Hampshire, New York, etc. It's so hard for us to do what we, uh, what we know that we need to do to make our, our educational system strong. Uh, so that's something to really uh, consider. I do think there's some changes that can be made. I, I would like to up the time to tenure by a year, so to give uh, principals and site administrators and, and teachers a little bit more time to hone their skills uh, before uh, before uh, you know, making that, that that decision about about tenure. Uh, I'd also like to find some more ways to bring uh, our best and brightest into the teaching profession. Uh, there, you know, one possibility would be to create a program where you know, the top. 5% of graduating seniors from high school have a path for higher education in return for a five-year teaching commitment. One of the problems with some of the existing programs is they only stick around for two, they don't end up sticking, staying with the profession. So, Sandra, education. You know, I, I think this really does come down to resources. Unfortunately, we're one of the last states in the country, 48, 49, depending on which analysis you look at, in per pupil investment in our students. And there's, very little possibility of our teachers being able to really succeed with the important tasks that we've given them when we're not giving them the resources they need to, to be able to complete that work. Um, so I'm in favor, and I'm actually part of Raising California Together, which is a group that did successfully increase our, our budget investment this year in early childhood ed to make sure that children are getting off on the right foot when they come into school. But we need to extend Prop 30, and we need to make sure that our, our teachers and students have the resources they need. The Common Core that we're going to be implementing over the next few years uh, shows a, a number of challenges to be addressed, making sure that arts and music education are included in that process and that we're not putting uh, computerized testing requirements on our students too soon. Uh, so there's going to be a number of really nuanced uh, issues to take on over the next few years. Thanks, Sandra. Okay, so I'd like to open up questions to the floor. I will give Kelsey the microphone. If you could keep uh, your responses to one minute this time around. Hi, um, I'm a mum. I'm a mum. I'm not used to speaking on the microphone, sorry, but I have been at Malibu High School for 16 years as a parent and my youngest is now a senior. Um, I have a question for both of you um, because, I, you know, we have a PCB problem. We also have a lot of toxins in our soil and they were disturbed by the school district um, illegally. And so my biggest question is this, um, my son, told me, he said, what's caulking anyway? And I said, it's the stuff, the moisture, that, it, the stuff that stops the moisture from getting on the window. And he said, oh my God, is it that plasticky, rubbery stuff? And I said, yes. 
said, we used to sit back and peel it off the window and chew on it. I'm going to try to say this without crying now. Um, here's my question, sorry. I've been working with the I've been working with the federal EPA because we're like the Hunger Games. Region 9 is also, which is our region in the EPA, is also with Arizona and Nevada. And we know how environmental those two states are. If, I lived, if my child had gone to Massachusetts, if I lived there, I would have no problem because the EPA made this a law five years ago, the federal EPA, that the PCBs were to be removed immediately. So my question is, do you support the district attorney's ongoing criminal investigation of why Malibu students and teachers are in classrooms having toxins, toxic PCBs 7,000 times EPA safety standard? And I ask this as a mother whose child has chewed on this, and probably not just once, and I'm probably fairly sure he's not the only idiot there. Thank you so much for the, the question and for sharing your personal experience. I know that's, that's difficult to, to speak out about, so thank you. Um, you know, I'm really proud to have stood with Malibu Unites, the group of parents and teachers and staff members who are very concerned about this issue at the school, and I'm really committed to trying to figure out what it is that I can do to be of support and assistance once I'm in the State Senate. I think there is potential for some legislation and some improvement around things like parental notification uh, when there is a possibility of this type of exposure. Uh, there's also possibilities for improvement around what the requirements for testing and, and for remediation are. And I look forward to, to partnering with all of you to be able to address the issue. Yeah, I think that, that there are, thank you, Cassandra, by the way. Um, I think that there are a number of things that, that really, going through this experience and serving on the school board and, 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 and seeing the way that this, uh, this whole thing has unfolded, uh, it makes you, first it gives you awareness of the fact that so many public buildings built before 1979 used PCBs in the caulking uh, as part of the construction of the buildings. Uh, yep, exactly. And that there are some, so I think I do support uh, parental notification. Uh, we've talked about this, Jennifer, a little bit. Uh, I also support a some sort of plan that would tie in as we're as we're moving forward with uh, AB 32 and some of the energy efficiency projects that are now going to be funded also through some of the school bonds. That window, that window repairs, be part of that process, and that PCB remediation can be part of that process too. So that there be an emphasis placed. We well know that we lose so much energy, we lose so much heat out of windows. And so we can be both killing two birds with one stone, dealing with the PCB remediation issue and also uh, uh, energy insulation at the same time. As a small business owner, I'm utterly concerned with the enormous amount of different types of taxes I pay. And every, uh, I'd say, year or two years, something else is going up. Obviously a hike in sales tax, uh, a hike in uh, state income tax, do you have any ideas? I mean, we say we have a surplus, that's wonderful. But at the bottom of the day, the end of the day, we have to really side with small business to create jobs. And you say we have so many people that are currently out of work. And a lot of businesses are leaving the state. So what would you do if you became state senator in resolving all of those issues? It's a great question, and it's certainly something I think that's on everyone's minds, especially as we move out of the recession. How do we make sure that we're going to see real job growth, we're going to see real economic opportunity, uh, particularly given all the challenges that currently exist in terms of, of, of cost uh, and, and affordability in our, in our area? So I think part of it has to do with what I talked about earlier, listening to business, engaging with business, uh, making sure you're hearing business leaders' concerns and, and not, you know, not writing laws uh, that, that, that don't take into account those concerns. I think it also has to do with you know, creating ways to, to, to tweak the tax system to you know, be able to reward and incentivize real high quality job growth. Uh, and, and then I think it also has to do with, um, with, with, with putting in place programs that really do help to, to try to encourage economic growth and development. Things like tourism, uh, things like the tech sector, uh, the aerospace industry in the South Bay, a lot of these kinds of industries that end up having a really important role in, in helping uh, kind of help the broader uh, local economy. 
You know, uh, when you talk to small business owners throughout the Los Angeles area, I think one of the, the biggest concerns is the gross receipts tax uh, at the city level. And so I'd like to find ways to partner with the city council uh, to be able to make some changes there. But I think there are also state taxes that, that need to be adjusted to take into account uh, that corporations certainly have different types of requirements depending on the size of the corporation. Uh, what fits for a Walmart-sized organization is not appropriate for a small business owner. And those are the types of really nuanced fixes uh, that we need to get into. I think there's also a role for elected officials in being real leaders on bringing capital and investment to the region. So, for example, we have Silicon Beach within this district. And we're really poised to be the next leader uh, on the silicon boom, uh, the tech boom, because it's going to be about entertainment and media combining. But we need to bring more venture capital to Los Angeles to be able to make that happen. Because right now, all of our engineers that are graduating in Southern California are leaving because there's not adequate growth in the sector. So I'd like to be a part of making that happen. Uh, this will be the last question. I, I'm sure everyone here supports more funding for our public schools and supporting and extending Prop 30. Assuming that funding is locked for our public schools at the moment, or that you can't have an effect on that in California, what other reforms or changes would you support to our state education system? Well, I, thank you for the question. Uh, I mentioned a couple of them. I think that, uh, that I'd like to see us figure out a, a the, the program I was talking about earlier that sort of modeled after something that they did in, in, in North Carolina, uh, where they provided an incentive program for people who finished in the top uh, percentage of top five percent, top ten percent of their graduating high school classes, and there'd be a, a pathway through the public higher education system, a free public higher education. You get your 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 uh, you know you, you get your teaching credential, and then you come and make a five year commitment to teaching in the public school system. One of the big challenges of the Teach for America program is that people stick around for only two years and then they oftentimes leave the profession. And uh, we need people to stick around. If people actually stay around for five years, they're much more likely to stay with the profession and move up the ranks. Uh, so that, that's, one, that's one little reform I talked about, the teacher uh, time, time to tenure. And then I, I'm very interested in kind of broader teacher empowerment issues. How do we get more teachers involved in the pedagogy and the, in the, in the leadership of schools? How do we get them actually, you know, they're, they're the experts. And oftentimes we end up kind of making them you know, sort of low-level bureaucrats when they have so much to give. And so I'm, I'm really just trying to institutionalize more teacher empowerment in pedagogy and academics. Thank you so much for the, the question. Um, I do want to address your, your question of what would be some reforms, but I just want to also share a little bit of background about why this is important to me. Uh, you know, I'm actually a little bit of a refugee here in Los Angeles. I've been here for about seven years. I went back and forth for work and school for a little while to the East Coast. Uh, but I came here because this is a, a community that has the kind of values that I agree with. I actually grew up in a really conservative community where, unfortunately, uh, the chair of the school board for my district didn't have a high school degree and thought that the most important priority was to lower school taxes and cut off funding. So I've seen the real consequences of not investing in education. Hey, uh, with us. Uh, I, I'm someone who, who has deep local roots. I'm from this district, I grew up here, and I came back to my hometown to give back and, and, and be engaged. I'm someone who's worked in the private sector and have the experience of, of working uh, and, and understanding business challenges and private sector challenges. But I'm also someone who has done some of the same sort of outside advocacy work uh, that Sanders been able to do, but I'm also someone who's been able to work from within government to make it work. So time spent as a, as a staffer on Capitol Hill and seeing the legislative process from that perspective. Uh, someone who served at the state level at the University of California's Board of Regents and getting two pretty important measures passed through the board, a, a board that was dominated by people far wealthier, far older, uh, far more powerful uh, uh, than me. Uh, and then of course, uh, two terms locally, uh, giving back in, in, in the community, helping to steer our district through some really difficult times, helping to protect our budget, helping to uh, protect and preserve some of those core programs that make such a difference for kids, the arts, uh, summer school, PE, libraries, nursing, et cetera, that, that have been so decimated in other school districts that we were able to preserve and protect in our district. I'm someone who cares deeply about this district, uh, someone who cares deeply about this community. Uh, I'm, I'm, I really want to, to give back. I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to, to go up to Sacramento and be able to work on some of these critical issues, things like environmental protection, things like uh, uh, educational 
uh, improving our educational system. And it's the reason why I think I've, been in, I've now been endorsed by a really wide range of people. Everyone from Henry Waxman and Xavier Slavsky, Fran Pavley, right the way over to Richard Reardon and, uh, and Don Canabia. I've been endorsed now by about 150 different local, current or former local elected officials. Most of the mayors in the district, most of the city council members. And I think it's because they know that I'm someone who understands what it's like to make government work, to take tough votes, to make tough decisions. I've now participated in the balancing of seven separate budgets. Uh, I'm going to take that experience, I'm going to take that homegrown knowledge to Sacramento to represent this district. So thank you so much for your time. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and I, I want to thank uh, the Mirror Media Group as well as the Rabbi and the Temple for opening us, uh, opening up their doors uh, and having us here today. You know, I've spoken about what my career has been devoted to. It's been primarily at the state level, working on legislation and policy across a wide range of policy issues, as I said. Uh, and I think that's really important experience for a state senator who will need to, to work not just on education, but on health care access, on poverty issues, on environmental concerns, on job creation, uh, all areas that I have devoted time and energy to. And I'm proud to say that I've helped to pass legislation in those areas. Um, so for me, that in addition to my work representing individuals one-on-one -on -one as their attorney, is unified by my goal of spending my career trying to figure out ways to amplify the voices of community members and of folks who are too often silenced in our government process. So for me, that's, that's what I'm taking to Sacramento, is how do, I, how do I open those doors? How do I bring all of you further into the process? That's what I've done for years, and that's what I want to be committed to, to doing there. And I've run my campaign in a way that you can trust that you all are the ones who will have influence over my decisions and uh, who I will be accountable to. So I'm committed to working on the issues that matter to you, things like educational investment and affordability, as well as environmental protection and progress, and above all, campaign finance reform and good governance, opening up Sacramento uh, away from special interests and toward our community. Uh, that's what's most important in this process for me. And I think you can trust that I'm actually going there to get things done, because you've actually seen how I make my decisions in the public spotlight that I don't shy away from taking a tough stand and that I don't change it depending on the political winds. Uh, but instead, I stand strong, I fight for our community, and I'll continue to do that in Sacramento. Because for me, this is not about figuring out how to advance my political career. If it were, I would have run for Congress. I'm going to Sacramento to get things done for all of us. Sandra and Ben, we very much appreciate your time. We know how busy it is on the campaign trail three weeks out from the election, so we wish you both best, the best of luck on November 4th. Thanks again.